I am in a great mood because of what I just found. Now, I have used things from this article before, I'm just realizing. I had never gone to the actual thing. And it, I hope you will stick with me for this one because it tackles maybe my my favorite portion of of the Old Testament and gives some great context which in a way sort of further vindicates I don't know if that's the right word I'm an idiot sometimes but it kind of further corroborates the story of Lehi and how that would make sense for that time period and we get some extra insight on some of the plain and precious things that may have been lost I know a lot of people don't really you know they they don't necess necessarily have a, a full picture of what we mean by that and I think even as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints we might think about something that about those plain and precious things truths that um we we might think about a portion of it without really taking into account another portion of it and i hope you'll stick with me to understand that but it further it, it corroborates i mean not not corroborates but it makes it more plausible uh lehigh's story it makes if joseph smith was just a, a brilliant guesser man was he ever brilliant it gives us extra context for this amazing beginning of the Book of Mormon, which I think we we really should start right. And uh, I'm talking about the time in, spoken in Jeremiah, the end of the kings, when Babylon would come in and take over, and then we have... We have people like Lehi. We have all these different prophets, Jeremiah. Uh, we have like another five of them or something that are named currently, like at that time. Some of them will go to Egypt and, you know, it'll just be this this scattering. Now, I like to refer to this chart here when I go through the Old Testament. I think it's great, you know, going through. It has the year, sort of. It has the king. It kind of has a good evil sort of thing, like at the start and at the end. It has a prophet around the same time. Then it has the scriptures involved. And then we have this split. We have Judah. We have Israel. Of course, Judah is in the the southern sort of region, and 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 Israel is in the north. We have these different prophets. And even though there are all these different prophets in both of these, Elijah is kind of, uh, you know, people talk about like Elijah as the prophet sort of of the northern kingdom, even though there are a whole bunch of them, which also makes the restoration and uh, uh, of Elijah coming back being like this, this restoring of the kind of beginning of the restoration of the 10 tribes and people, you know, sitting out a plate for Elijah and all that. But that would be a tangent. Uh, going down, we have all these different kings. And, of course, Assyria came, which if we bring up a map, we have Israel at the time. This isn't a current map for that time. But we have uh, Egypt, of course, up and down the Nile. And we had Assyria, who was just killing it, like literally. Literally, and then we have uh, we have Babylon and Phoenicia, and this at the time of of Lehi, we had Assyria. Assyria is just crumbling, and so in that power vacuum, we have Babylon way to the east and Egypt, and they are just kind of gobbling up stuff. We have the Scythians. That also came down and kind of uh, came down, I think, in like 620-something B.C. And we have Israel right in the nexus in the middle here. So we have times where, where the kings of Israel 
like, uh, I believe, you know, we have Josiah, who we are going to talk about. His son uh, is going to be the next king after that. Then we have Jehoiakim and uh, Joachim, and I think they were both like vassals for Egypt. And then, of course, Babylon would come in and set up Zedekiah as as a uh, as a king, a vassal king for for Babylon. Now, uh, this is so interesting. This article that we get, and it talks a little bit more about the context of that time. And this person, Margaret Barker, I think is her name, right? Margaret Barker. Uh, Joseph Smith and pre-exilic uh, Israelite religion. She is. She was not LDS, LDS, I believe Methodist, and she goes into uh, she goes into the story of Lehi and how I think she more she would more take on the idea that like Joseph Smith really was on the ball with this with this thing he was writing so even though she wasn't a believer man you got to hear some of the stuff that she was saying about about uh about, about this whole thing so i will go into you know i'll have my extra little things to say i don't know if i'll read all of this i think it's it's a few pages but it is so great now if you don't know what the deuteronomic reforms are that is all about king josiah and remember, we had uh, it was kind of a polytheistic sort of uh, place, like everywhere else in the world. We think that that Israel was very monotheistic the whole way through, but they had struggles with, you know, they worship Baal at some times. And even though they had this temple, it was like soon after building this temple, we have it being desecrated, and we have these we have these altars around everywhere and uh even though people were also worse also worshiping jehovah or yahweh i guess we'll we'll say we have uh we have worshiped to baal and these phoenician gods and all these different things and another thing that was being done at the time is people were worshiping within their within their homes and people had their idols but people people would also worship uh jehovah or worship the Lord in their own homes. So, uh, but things when they the the temple book of the law was within the temple, and just not anyone would get to go into the temple to read those things. And Josiah, just being young, found you know someone found this book and brought it to him, and it had it had. Uh, it had the books of, you know, it had a, people believe it was just Deuteronomy. So he was going to reaffirm uh, tradition and belief in, in or, or proper ritualistic uh, festivals and rituals and, and whatever the case in worshiping the Lord in the prescribed manner that is found in this book of the law and it did a number of things where i i think well intentioned though it may be it is clear that some of the prophets like jeremiah and like lehi uh didn't really agree with it wholesale you can kind of imagine it as tossing out some of the tossing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, where even though some of it was trying to become a more orthodox sort of way of doing things, uh, like such as we, we, they got rid of this book of the, they got the book of the law and they got rid of the, they got rid of the, the altars and they, for Baal, and they did a, a number of things one of the things that we will find also is they got rid of overt messianic sort of uh, writing. Now, we still find that in the Old Testament. And I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, but just so you know kind of what to look for, 
uh, and, and we we still find it within the DNA of the Old Testament, but it is clear that there is some stuff from that time that uh, that we don't have today. So when we think of some of the plain and precious truths that were missing, we often think, well, it must have been the, the early bishops at the times of the creeds, and they didn't see something they liked, so they, they got rid of some of the records. And we know that, uh, you know, we know that some of that happened for, for better or for worse. There's lots of apocryphal writing that, yeah, it doesn't seem, it doesn't, it, it could have been a total, fa you know, a fabrication from a non-inspired source. Uh, but it was, it was based on popular vote in that time. But at this time, we are getting a version of that. So even those these Deuteronomic reforms are meant for a certain outcome, uh, it, it appears that we are missing some of the things that, that ought to have been there. And at this time, we know that the lots of what we are going to get from of the Old Testament is going to be filtered through... Uh, as a result of these reforms, and it will stretch out in a lot of ways all the way, you know, all the way to who knows when. But you can see some of their, their perhaps over shooting beyond the mark at that time. Also kind of you can examine the same sort of thing in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you can, you know, you, you see it with some of these creeds where people will, will uh, excommunicate because of wrong thinking. And, and, you know, it reminds me of also how we are treated sometimes, like not considered Christian. It, it, like we are, we are like the unclean uh, Samaritans to mainstream, some of mainstream Christianity, like who, you know, people don't realize what what they are doing but anyway this is not supposed to be about that um i just want you to get in the right headspace though before we get into this because margaret barker examines that aspect of plain and precious truths at this time and of all the times for people to to leave jerusalem because there is a purge happening and even those writings maybe would not be safe of plain and precious truths that could have been there. Uh, you know, this is this is the time. So it's just another reason that Joseph Smith is like, you know, either he, he was a prophet or this was an amazing, amazing guess. So I want to go through some of it. If, you know, if that's all you want to you want to hear, you know, you can go to this yourself if you want uh but i'm going to read through some of it and i i hope you'll stick around because it's very interesting uh and i'll I, i'll try to breeze through some of this now uh let, let's just keep going and i'll try to scan through a bit so terrell givens has set joseph smith in the religious and cultural context of his time and raised many important issues i should like to take a few of these issues and set them in another context that of pre-exilic Jerusalem. And remember, this is right before Babylon came and uh, took the first group of them away, and then people like Daniel and, uh, and then would have come back. And, and this is right when the Book of Mormon is about to begin. Or, or may, you know, it, it's talking about that time. So... I am not a scholar of Mormon texts and traditions. I'm a biblical scholar specializing in the Old Testament. And until some Mormon scholars made contact with me a few years ago, I would next have never have considered my using Mormon texts and traditions as part of my work. Since that initial contact, I have had many good and fruitful exchanges and have begun to look at these texts very closely. I am still, however, very much an amateur in this area. What I offer can only be the reactions of an Old Testament scholar 
sorry, I, when I read out loud, I some you know I'm not good at reading out loud, but uh, are the revelations of Joseph Smith con- are the revelations of Joseph Smith consistent with the situation in Jerusalem in about 600 BC? So that is what is being examined. Do the revelations of Joseph Smith fit in the context of the reign of King Zedekiah, who is mentioned at the beginning of the first book of Nephi, which begins in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah? Zedekiah was installed as king in Jerusalem in 597 BCE. Uh, Now, I I think some of this might be the context that we got. I I breezed through most of it. Uh, Let's see. Givens raises the companion question of open canon, ongoing revelation, and prophetic preeminence. As far as we know, there was no idea of a closed canon in 600 BCE. And this is so important because people will lift up the Bible. Uh, even now, it's like a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible. And what is the story of the Book of Mormon? And what is the story of when Jesus came? It's like a Torah, a Torah, we have a Torah. And now a Bible, a Bible, we have a Bible. And there is this idea that we have now of this closed, ultra-closed canon when we know that Jesus, he he quoted a number of of other things that were clearly within the lexicon of of Scripture, and we know that some of that is just gone. Ongoing revel. Uh, let's see. And an ongoing revelation and the prophets was accepted in that day, even if what the pro and this isn't an LDS person saying this even if what the prophet said was sometimes very uncomfortable. One generation before Zedekiah, there had been a great upheaval in the reign of King Josiah, something now regarded as the turning point in the history of Jerusalem and its religion. Uh, we talk about the, the reforms, and we had all these things. And if you want to go back, go look at my Laman and Lamuel. Like they, they likely, or they could have been one of these Deuteronomist, Deuteronomist reform types because they became these this the these people who who adopted this they became the new kind of cultural orthodoxy in terms of how we were going to who to do things in Jerusalem and again one of the things that was removed or seems to be removed was this idea of uh, a messiah that would be born as the son of God. And I I don't know if that's mentioned here, or it might be in another thing. Um, Who said that? I have another thing up here. Shoot. Eh, It doesn't matter. But that might have been, uh, it might get to that. Uh, But kind of Messiah type talk is very taken away. And they have this focus on if we do the right stuff, the law will will save us. You know, we have these walls. We saw what happened when the Assyrians came in with the time of Hezekiah. Uh, we have a water source going into our city. We we're good as long as we do this. We don't need we don't need to repent or do things wrong. We we have you know we are doing this. We are doing things. Uh, in an orthodox manner where we don't need someone to come in and protect us like David, right? Uh, so let me let me go. Other ancient texts had a very different view of Josiah and his work, but since they were eventually not included in the Bible, they are not often considered when the Bible is taught today. Yet here is our our first Warning. If some of the wickedness in Jerusalem mentioned in uh, if, if some of the wickedness in Jerusalem mentioned in the first book of Nephi included parts of Josiah's temple purges, we should expect to find information relevant. And rem- remember, this is some of the stuff in the temple that was being purged. Uh, we should expect to find information relevant in the Mormon tradition in texts outside of the Bible. And we do. Moreover, the biblical texts themselves take on new significance. 
if we no longer assume that everyone agreed with Josiah's purge. Jeremiah, a contemporary of King Josiah, had has many passages that seem to criticize what was just happened what had what has just happened in the city. Perhaps reflecting these uh, ancient disagreements, some books mentioned in the Old Testament are now lost. Uh, First Chronicles 29:29, for example, cites as sources for the history of King David, the Chronicles of Samuel the Seer. Like, I want to read that. The Chronicles of Nathan the Prophet and the Chronicles of Gad the Seer. There are several more examples of lost books. Some books found among the Dead Sea Scrolls are clearly sacred texts, but we did not know them previously. But again, since they're not in the Bible in that exact form, it's like these are heretical to people's viewpoint like people don't understand like how how we come about the like we worship we worship the lord and we want to learn about god and the bible is the word of god as long as it is translated correctly but there is more that would give more context and of course we have to filter through that stuff with discernment but there is more out there uh there are several more examples of lost books some books okay okay uh let's see uh even the biblical texts found among the dead sea scrolls have significantly different wording from the masoretic hebrew Brew text in several places, reminding me of Joseph Smith's translation when Moroni spoke the words of Malachi, but with a little variation. It can come as a shock to traditional Christians to discover that there were different versions of the Old Testament text in the time of Jesus. We cannot know for certain which Bible Jesus knew, neither the books we he regarded as scripture nor the precise text of these books, even though we have our current canonized books of the Bible. We just don't know uh, how, how, what other things that were uh, out there that he considered. Um, let me see. Uh, Given spoke of the scandal that Joseph Smith claimed direct communication from God, we now recognize that King Josiah enabled a particular group to dominate the religious scene in Jerusalem about 620 BCE, the Deuter Deuteronomists. Josiah's purge had driven, was driven by their ideals, and their scribes influenced much of the form of the Old Testament we have today, for better or for worse. Especially, uh, like, in a lot of ways, we have so much to think about them codifying this stuff and putting so much emphasis in making sure we would have that but man I, I like what about the stuff that we don't know what about the stuff that got they got rid of and of course anyway the uh, the deuteronomists uh especially uh, sorry especially the history of first and second kings the deuteronomists denied that anyone had a vision of the lord they denied that anyone had revelations from heaven, and they insisted the Ten Commandments were all that were necessary. And what did what did Lehi have? He has so they have this book of the law that they now have in their hands. And what does what do we get with Nephi? He talks. He has this vision. The spirits open up to him, and he sees twelve. And they hand to him a book, a different book. And because of this book and the other things that probably it had more of a fullness, he goes back and he, he, tells, he tells Jerusalem to repent. But they are rejecting, they are rejecting people having visions. They are rejecting people uh, uh, having revelations. And when do when do Laman and Lamuel first start to murmur? It's when it's when Lehi builds an altar and says he has visions and like just him building an altar away 
from the temple already is total no, like, not good for, you know, if they are Deuteronomists, this is majorly heretical. And remember, they would have seen Lehi doing this as totally blasphemous and Nephi going along with it. And in their mind, you can see how uh, they could have got, felt morally and ethically justified to kill a blasphemer like Lehi and Nephi. We just kind of see them as unbelievers, but uh, and it, they could have been that, but, you know, they it, it's very interesting. They could have been, we don't know exactly what they are unbelievers of, uh, if it was just the Lord, but like if, if they were Deuteronomist, it, it would fall right in line with what we read in the Book of Mormon. Nothing, m- nothing more was to be added to them, right? How many times have we heard that? We heard that in that time in 600. We heard it in Jesus's time. We've heard it after. We hear it today. It is a pattern. Prophecies were genuine only if they already had fulfilled and had no more power. Like, no no need for, and, and definitely no need for ongoing revelation. Like, they, they put, they are the ones who put a stop to prophets. It wasn't the Lord putting a stop to sending people to warn us. It was that they just... They put a stop to it culturally. They put blinders on. The Deuteronomists had no place, and and that foundation just kept going until we have Jesus and the apostles, but right back, right back to blinders and no more. No more prophets. But who, who is the one restricting the Lord? Anyway. Don't want to go too far down that tangent, but, you know. Uh, the Deuteronomists had no place for angels, and so they did not use the title Lord of Hosts. Again, this is not an LDS person writing this. These were the minds that eventually led to the chosen, the closed canon of Scripture and the cessation of prophecy. But the prophets did have visions of the Lord and the angels, and they did did speak in the name of the Lord, and their unfulfilled prophecies were carefully preserved. Not everyone shared the views of the Deuteronomists, but the writings of other people are often outside the Bible. The Deuteronomists wrote the history of the kings of Jerusalem, and they obviously would have, uh, you know, filtered, filtered things that didn't seem to fit within their paradigm uh doesn't mean it was wrong what they wrote but just that it was incomplete um and of course that's a that's a big thing a big thing to say like we believe the bible as long as it is translated correctly but again we we could have had more compiling it from written sources about ancient kings and heroes about the might uh, much as much as we might compile a history today. Other ancient texts, however, give a different picture of how history was written. Past, present, and future were revealed to prophetic figures. Those three sources mentioned in 1 Chronicles were all prophets, Samuel the seer, Nathan the prophet, and Gad the seer. We find prophetic history also in the Book of Jubilees, part of which were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls some 50 years ago. The full text of the book has been rediscovered in had been rediscovered in Ethiopia and dis, uh, published at the end of the 19th century but the scroll fragments confirm that it was an ancient book jubilees describes how the past and the future were revealed to moses on sinai and how he was told to write down what he learned enoch of whom i will say more later saw all the history of his people Past, present, and future in dream visions. And if you have that, if you have those blinders on, uh, 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 you know, like Enoch, man, I, I, we have these different versions. 
Um, I don't want to talk about that right now because this will make it too long. The Christians said that the that Jesus had revealed the past, the present, and the future, and the Book of Revelation did not reveal only the future. If prophets revealed the past as well as the future, the revelation of history to Joseph Smith is not out of character. Another enigmatic history in First Enoch, known as the Apocalypse of Weeks, implies that Josiah's purge was a disaster. And, of course, if that was an ancient uh, text, like, uh, of course that wouldn't be part of the canon if it's, <laughs> if it's talking about that sort of thing. This history, and of, and of course, you, know, you have to take everything that I say with a grain of salt, because I'm an idiot. But I do love this stuff, and uh, anyway, I don't want to call myself an idiot, but, you know, I am an idiot sometimes, but it is interesting. This history makes no mention of the Exodus. How was it possible to have such a history for the Deuteronomist? The story of Moses leading the Exodus from Egypt was the defining event, defining event of their history in the centuries after Josiah's purge, and after the demise of the monarchy in Jerusalem, legends surrounding Moses made Moses more and more like the ancient kings. By the time of Jesus, even the Egyptian Jew Philo could describe Moses as the god and king of his people. But the people who considered Josiah's legalistic reforms to be a disaster could not also have considered Moses a dominant figure. For many years, scholars have suspected that the account of Moses on Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments had been merged with memories of Solomon's temple, and that a temple ritual is important because there, there's going to be a lot of temple stuff here. That a temple ritual, when the uh, he anointed, when the anointed king brought divine revelation from heaven, had been blended with the Moses on Sinai story. And we will see things, you know, we will see things about the temple. And we will get talk about, like, the priesthood of Melchizedek and how first temple worship was different than what happened after Josiah when it went back to reforms. If we only could see, if we only knew what we don't know. Um, but things were really filtered, filtered out. And this person is also suggesting that, uh, you know, things about the temple ritual were, were changed. And what did Moses have? She is going to suggest that, that some of the religion of, of, that was given to Abraham, remember Melchizedek, uh, we have Abraham, a lot of that might have stretched much closer to the time of Josiah and that much of the plain and precious truths are actually about that specific element. What did the Deuteronomists get rid of? It's like, it's like Egypt scratching out faces and words we simply just don't know what we don't know unless the Lord would have brought a prophet out to preserve that. The Apocalypse of Weeks describes how an unnamed person received the law for all generations. Whilst there were visions of the holy and righteous, was, was this perhaps a temple vision scene? where a god and king receive, figure received revelation in heaven among the angels and brought it to earth, the same figure ab later absorbed into Moses. There are many places where memories of the Old Testament ritual survive. For example, the Son of Man figure and the Holy Ones in Daniel 7. I wondered about such incidents when I first read Lehi's vision of the open heaven, the angels and the radiant figure descending to give Lehi a book. Most of the summaries of history in the Old Testament focus on Moses 
and the Exodus, but omit the Sinai story. In other words, they are the exact opposite of the Apocalypse of Weeks. Scholars have suspected for some time that Sinai and Exodus were originally distinct traditions, joined only after the destruction of the first temple, with Exodus predominating. The earliest function in the Bible, and this, there's a lot going on here. We'll, we'll get back on track, but this is interesting. The earliest fusion in the Bible is in Nehemiah 9, 9-15, a document from the 5th century BCE. The, remember, this is, if you want context, they've just, uh, the, the Bible has been, or the Jerusalem and the temple has been destroyed. P, Jeremiah probably went to Egypt. Uh, we have the people in ba- uh, Babylon. They finally get to go back because of Cyrus, and they are able to rebuild the temple. And Nehemiah is the one who's going to like help them organize to rebuild the walls, and the Samaritans will not like that they are doing that. And uh, so we are getting that. That's where we're at here. Uh, after the Deuteronomist reforms, but some of that tradition would still be still be in place. The final form of the Pentateuch may have been compiled even later by people who emphasized Moses and the Exodus rather than the temple tradition. Remember, they went and they became scribes. Uh, they might have been scribes bef- before this time, but certainly in Babylon they were writing. And then uh, there was more and more of this writing going around, and and uh, if there was a focus on the Deuteronomic stuff happening, then on then on temple tradition, like she is suggesting, then we have an incomplete picture, and we would just kind of make assumptions about what was happening happening in the temple especially if it was very sacred and we didn't know unless those records were kept in the temple. And if we have kings that aren't, aren't doing those things or, uh, you know, if they are, they are taking over the temple and just using it for their own stuff and no one is having access to this, uh, this stuff. And they only, I call this stuff, but the scrolls, the temple scrolls, the true temple scrolls, and we go back to just the Deuteronomist stuff, and it, it seems like Jeremiah feels like there were portions of that that, you know, it, it was wrong to just go only into that. Um, man, we might have lost a whole bunch. We might have lost a whole, whole bunch. Uh, and if, anyway, remember, they're waiting for the Messiah. Some of the people, if we know in the Book of Mormon that that Lehi t- talked about a-, a Messiah all the time. Like every page of the Book of Mormon before Jesus comes is in this Law of Moses period. But as a part of it, we have all this temple stuff and we have all this talk about the the Messiah that would one day come. So it's like where we still love and venerate the Bible, we know that Jesus would come. We know that they, so many people would not recognize because they had a different paradigm where they were focused on the law protecting them. And now we have a new kind of law that does not talk about temples. Like we don't, we, people, anyway. I'm so grateful for the temple. For others, though, a different history of Jerusalem had been summarized in Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks. A vision... Oh, did I just read this? Oh, a, a vision of history given to Enoch by angels and learn, learned from heavenly tablets. It describes Noah and Abraham, Noah, Abraham the law giving, the temple, the disaster in the temple just before it was destroyed and the scattering of the chosen people. Try to imagine how these different groups might have reacted to discovering their history rewritten, supplemented by the history of their Lord appearing in Egypt and rescuing some people there, 
and how they might have reacted to Ezekiel's claim that the Lord had appeared to his people in Babylon. In the course of time, all these accounts have been absorbed into the tradition of ongoing uh, revelation. The authors of the Apocalypse of Weeks, however, saw the people who rebuilt Jerusalem and wrote the biblical histories as apostates. Even though we consider those histories as the norm, the Apocalypse of Weeks, that tiny fragment of ancient history in First Enoch is almost forgotten and considered rather strange. Remember, if it doesn't fit with your paradigm, it's just some weird oddball thing, right? While this dynamic world of prophets and revelation is con uh, consonant with the picture presented in the Book of Mormon, we may compare that situation with the crisis that has now engulfed biblical scholarship. Archaeology simply does not give supporting evidence that for a great deal of the history in the Old Testament. Scholars are asking themselves, what are we reading? Whose Bible is this? When was it written? Is the Old Testament older than its earliest written deposits found among the Dead Sea Scrolls? And why are some of those from the Old Testament at why are some of those different from the Old Testament as we have known it? Like they feel like everyone just passed along this book and and had the these same twenty whatever scrolls or fifty scrolls and just like there there was much more. There was much more. Man, are we only halfway through this? How far are we? All right, well, this is going to be a long-haul one, guys. I hope you uh, stick with me, though. I'm already 40 minutes. Let us consider another of Given's points. The question of human beings becoming divine and accepting the serpent's invitation to be as gods. In the later, in the later Old Testament traditions, wanting to be as the gods was indeed a sin. But how much, uh, but how might such an invitation be viewed in 600 BC? The familiar story of Adam and Eve is the reworking of an older story after memories of the loss of Eden and the loss of the original temple had merged. And it's interesting to be heard. This is an article from a non-LDS individual. The tree, and like so much of what we have in the bible is like when we th when we see trees we really like tree of life in lehi's vision and trees in the in the in genesis we really should think of temple narratives the tree that had been originally intended for the human for human food was the tree of life and the performed oil of that tree was to have been used to anoint humans and make them like the angels, sons of God. Again, when we talk about being uh, as gods, notice how it is little, little G here, even though we still have God, big G. But God has been, hij like that term has been hijacked, like where it's just heretical to consider these statements and if we are becoming like God, that is like in some way um, replacing our need for him when that is not the case. This was the tradition of the ancient priests who thought of themselves as angels, messengers from heaven. The, uh, Malachi 2.7 The tree of life gave wisdom and eternal life. But the human, pair the human pair disobeyed and chose knowledge that could be used for good or evil. Only then did they discover that they were barred from the tree of life. Of course, there would be a plan to allow them back. The prophet Ezekiel, who also lived in Jerusalem in 600 BCE, said that the anointed one in Eden became mortal and died because wisdom and perfection had been abused for the sake of power and splendor. Satan's deception of Eden was to imply that both the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil had the same benefit. Both made humans like the angels. It was the disobedience that was the problem, not the state they aspired to. 
and they had to be barred from eternal life because they had disobeyed. Now, uh, we have a different viewpoint of that term, but, you know, like, anyway, immortality, really, but we have a different idea of eternal life. In the book of Revelation, this is reversed. The faithful Christian is promised access again to the tree of life. It comes full circle, which meant access to the angel state. We don't consider that so much. It was not the aspiration, but the attitude that was wrong. In 600 BCE, the sin would have been pride and disobedience, not the wish to be angels and sons of God. When Isaiah described the sins of Jerusalem, he emphasized pride, rebellion, and the, the abuse of knowledge. These, and you, you can go down a big old tangent about all these different uh, empires and things that we have the ruins of and some of the writings and traditions of and, and what is the cycle of what was their downfall. So often it is pride. It just makes you wonder about today. Holy smokes. These themes are strongly reflected in the Book of Mormon. All these failings are equated with the sins of fallen angels, uh, not with the breaking of the Ten Commandments. Remember, the fallen angels, uh, people, like God made humans un with his image. Uh, and then the fallen angels would, you know, we have this tradition of them breeding with, with like different animals and making these different hybrids and things and all these weird concoctions and think of all the different think of all the different things we have in our ancient past where it's like you think you see the the scent the Greek stuff with the centaurs and the harpies and the and the minotaur and stuff and we have Egyptian stuff with these people with weird heads. Uh, animal heads, and we have the Sumerian, like, guys that has, like, the big beard, and he has a whatever body. And, like, all over the world, we have this tradition of this hybridization. And, um, like, it's just so odd. It's so odd to see that. But uh, it just seems to be a part of the pride where they are making man in their image. And then, like... Noah is going back to a pure sort of way, but that is a big tangent. Anyway, pride, pride, pride. This, and then remember, in in what's supposed to be the beast, it's this huge, it's this crazy amalgamation hybrid again to be like once again thrust upon, like thrust upon the world sort of thing. Just wild. Um, this correction invites us to re-examine a related assumption. That the books in the Old Testament are older than the ancient Israelite books not in the Old Testament. Huh. The, the, the Enoch texts must be late, it is assumed, because they are not in the Bible. Right. That makes sense. Last year, I published a commentary on Isaiah that showed that the original Isaiah of, Jerus of Jerusalem knew the Enoch traditions, but not much concerned, but was not much concerned with Moses. Instead, I Isaiah's world was the world of Enoch's angels. Right, it's just so interesting, like some of the language. Hmm. Other scholars are now exploring the possibility that Enoch uh, Enoch traditions underlie some of the older stories in Genesis. Enoch traditions could have been very important in 600 BCE, just as the revelation to Joseph Smith implies. Mm. The emphasis placed on Enoch's writings should not surprise us, as the Enoch tradition shows show clearly the human beings uh, are to continue their lives on earth uh, can become Angels, and I don't think of angels with like wings, but like uh, a, a, a different version of ourselves, sort of that was like gods with little g, 
so to speak. And again, that's been hijacked. Um, but we know that we are to become as the gods and that uh, when, uh, when Adam and Eve were, were sent to the garden, they were to become like us and have knowledge like us. In, and us meaning the, 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 the narrator who's speaking in that in that uh, in Genesis in those chapters, in the coded language of Enoch's, uh, and no, yeah, anyway, in the coded language of dream, Enoch's dream visions, animals represent human beings and men are angels. Noah, we read, was born a bull and became a man after an angel taught him a secret. That's interesting. And in the apocalypse of weeks, there are three men, Noah, Abraham, and possibly Isaiah, but the text is enigmatic. The Enoch books are clearly in the same tradition as the Bible, yet there is no quotation from the Bible in them. Those are preserved. Uh, those who preserved the Enoch traditions may have different scriptures. Uh, I, I want to zip through this. Like, this has got to be almost done, right? Okay, I guess ish. Let me zip through. Um, let me let me. S I know it goes into like Asherah and that kind of stuff. Let me let me go. Let me skip some of it. But like, uh, hostility to wisdom was a hallmark of the Deuteronomists. Like when, whenever we argue with people of other Christian faiths, there's always on these epistemological kind of ways, and it's never about. It, it's so often never about, um, like, when we argue under their terms, they argue under a terms of closed canon, and they just don't understand that we are arguing with the foundation of open canon. And they keep saying, well, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And, and we say, uh, yeah, there's other stuff. Like, we don't expect everything we know to be in the Bible. Like, we are arguing on different, about different things. Uh, hostility, uh, and due to the wisdom, the mother, oh, right, it talks about the mother of, it talks about Ashira and the tree and the, the it talks about how it kind of goes in line with the mother of the Lord, your God, in Lehi's vision. And it's very interesting. You can pause it and whatever if you want. Um, but it's very, very interesting. We have the tree of life made one happy according to the book of Proverbs. But for detailed descriptions of the tree, we have to rely on non-canonical texts. Enoch described it as uh, as perfumed like fruit with fruit like grapes and a text discovered in Egypt in 1945 described the tree as beautiful fiery and the fruit like white grapes what does that remind you of I do not know of any other source that describes a fruit as white grapes imagine my surprise when I read the account of Lehi's vision of the tree whose white fruit made one happy and the interpretation that the virgin in Nazareth was the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. And you have to go back up there. Sorry, I skipped that stuff. Whoops. This is the heavenly mother, represented by the tree of life. And then Mary and her son on earth. This revelation to Joseph Smith was the ancient wisdom symbolism intact and almost certainly as it was known in 600 BC. Isn't that amazing to say? Like, of course, this would have been removed by Deuteronomists if it was not, if they had a specific view of what they were reading and, and not open to the paradigm that, that, there is there is more to be understood but this is something that like we call you know that would make us blasphemous for even considering that uh consider as well the mysterious rod of iron in the book of mormon vision 
In the Bible, the rod of iron is mentioned four times as the rod of the Messiah. Each mention in the King James Version says the Messiah uses the rod to break the nations or to rule them. The ancient Greeks translation is significantly different. It understood the Hebrew word in Psalms 2.9 to mean shepherd, and it reads, he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. The two Hebrew verbs for break and shepherd, pasture, tend, lead, look very familiar and in some forms are identical. The Greek text of the book of Revelation actually uses the word shepherd. Uh, of the Messiah and his iron rod. He fed them, he led them. Lehi's vision has the iron rod guiding people to the great tree. The older and probably the original understanding of the word. Wow. Forgotten memories of the temple. There can also be no doubt that teachings from the time of the first temple have been lost. Or rather, they now are now to be found only in the texts outside of the Bible. Jewish tradition says that all the sacred texts were lost when Jerusalem was destroyed and that Ezra the scribe restored them inspired by God Most High to dictate 94 books. Only 24 of them could be revealed. The rest were to be kept secret. This story may refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in 597 BCE or to the second destruction of 70 CE. Either way, it was recognized that the original scriptures had been lost and the on, and that only a fraction of their those restored became the public canon justin martyr as well as there are other there are other uh, original christians that echo justin martyr it's not just him but justin martyr a christian writer in the middle of the 2nd century ce claimed that the jews had been altering the scriptures an Aramaic document from the same record, known as the Scroll of Fasting, lists the, uni- the anniversaries of great events of, in the Second Temple period as days on which it was forbidden to fast. On the 3rd of Tishri, it was forbidden to fast because the memory of the documents were re- was removed, or the memory was removed from the documents. Some records had been destroyed, and this was a cause for celebration. It would have been interesting to know what these were. Understatement. The book of First Enoch records that lying words had been written, perverting the original, the eternal covenant. What that would that eternal covenant be? I mean, as members of the church, like we we look back to what was uh, uh, like Abraham. What we have Melchizedek, and we knew that Jesus was of the order. Of Melchizedek, but there is this gap in between. And if people are like, "Well, what what's lost from the Bible?" There's nothing lost. Well, what about the order that Jesus Himself was a part of? And it's mentioned here as well with with this person who is a biblical scholar who understands that some things are not there anymore in the Bible. Sinners had altered. The truth as they made copies, made fabrications, and writ- and written books in their own name. The Quran also tells of people who had altered the meaning of texts, had composed texts they claimed as scripture, and had accepted only part of the sacred text. One passage describes how some of the people of the book threw it away and chose instead to follow evil teachings from Babylon. This could easily be describing the people who returned from Babylon the second, and built the second temple, people whom Enoch called the apostate generation. Like they came back and before they even did anything with the temple, like it just lied. It was just still in rubble and they had, it, it kind of talks about their plated, their nice ornamented like homes and things and the walls still remain kind of crappy and... um. That's when we would have Nehemiah and, and Ezra. 
show up on the scene. Uh, one passage describes... Uh, here we go. There are many simple, uh, similar references in the Quran, for example, to people who look for allegorical and hidden meanings rather than the plain meaning of the text and who twist the words of Scripture. The Quran also mentions the Book of Abraham and the Book of Moses, described as the books of the earliest revelation. These are prophecies in Arabia in the 7th century. They resonate in the words of Nephi about plain and precious things taken away from the book as well as the as Joseph Smith's revelation of texts called the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. Along, of course, we don't like follow the Quran, uh, but yeah, it's interesting that that would be brought up. Along the same lines, the extraordinary simil- extraordinary similarity between the histories of the Rechabites, Rechabites. The narrative of, of Yosemite. Oh, this is interesting. Now, I'm not going to go into it, but it is uh, basically reflective of the story of Lehi leaving Jerusalem uh, that that has already been studied by Mormon scholars. But this was found after, after the Book of Mormon was published. And it basically has... It's an ancient text that sur- survives Greek, Syriac, and Ethiopia. It tells of a man, of some people who left Jerusalem about 600 BCE. And where's the name of the... Do I still have that up? Shoot. Uh, they were called the Sons of Rechat, Re- whatever, uh, which could mean that he was their ancestor or it could be the Hebrew way of saying they were temple servants. How interesting is that? Priests who served the divine throne. Now, if these people had the truth, like they would not have been... Um, they would not have been safe in, in, uh, like they would have been severely persecuted if they believed in a different type of temple worship and home worship. And it, like, it's weird. Why would we have the story of Lehi? But maybe, like, maybe people knew of, I, I don't know, whatever. Like, it, it wouldn't seem like we would have Lehi's story because it will find them, like, making their way across the ocean to a new land and like sitting under a tree and eating this, this fruit, um, which like is an animal, like it's echoes Lehi's vision. If you just go read it, but it also has some weird like stuff in it. Very interesting though, that they got, they left, left Jerusalem, this family, maybe priestly types that knew uh, like temple types, and uh, got sent to this, got carried to this new land. We're almost done here, promise. Uh, g- this is the most important thing, probably. Given spoke of Joseph Smith's thorough giving endeavor to overturn the most sacred tenets of cultural Christianity. And, and that's the hardest thing to overturn. The one of... Uh, and one of these must be the identity of Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, who appears in the Old Testament as the God of Israel. New Testament scholars agonize over why the first Christians applied Yahweh texts uh, to Jesus. And how, they ask, could all of the early Christian teachers have found Jesus in the Old Testament? When I wrote a book setting out all this rather obvious evidence— it was regarded as strange and hopelessly radical. Another example, the Jerusalem Bible, the translation prepared by the Roman Catholic Church, leaves the name Yahweh in the Old Testament instead of using the customary form, the Lord, and then has the Lord in the New Testament. is that interesting? With one editorial decision, they broke the link between the Old Testament and the New and obscured the fundamental proclamation of the first Christians. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is Yahweh. A third example, the New Testament, the New English translation of the Tagrim, the Aramaic version of the Old Testament, does not use the term Messiah in the Psalms when translating the Hebrew word, whatever, which means Messiah. 
does not use that term. The reason given is, it does not seem appropriate to use words like Messiah and Messianic in connection with the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. It was my challenge to assumptions such as these, which simply ignore the evidence of both the Hebrew Bible and of early Christian writings that led to my first contact with Mormon scholars. The original temple tradition was that Yahweh, again, the original temple tradition, was that Yahweh the Lord and the Son of God Most High uh, was, sorry, the, the, or let me say that one more time, more clearly, not reading like an idiot. The original temple tradition was that Yahweh, the Lord, was the Son of God Most High and present on earth as the Messiah. This means that the older religion in Israel would have taught about the Messiah. Just how we get that in the Book of Mormon with Lehi well before Jesus. But now in, in the current version, we can see echoes of how it, 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 there are analogs, there are like parallels or types, um, but it, it's not as clear as what we would find with what Lehi has. This means that the older tradition in Israel would have taught about Messiah. Thus, finding Christ in the Old Testament is exactly what we should expect, though obscured by incorrect readings of the scriptures. This is, I suggest, one aspect of the restoration of the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them. The Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Christ of the Book of Mormon. Wow. Very interesting. Okay, last page here. Yearning of the Temple. With the destruction of Jerusalem shortly after 600 BC, the great loss was without it, without doubt. Uh, the temple. And what do what did in our last conference, what was the main focus? It was the temple. The temple, it's angels and angels. Everything they represented, but we just, it's like a Bible, a Bible. We don't need these. We don't need these rituals. We don't need this. We just like, we just need faith. And yes, we need faith. And it's about this final sacrifice that Jesus did. And we do need faith in that. But there is, we show our faith through what we, through the, our good works. And there is more that did not fit the paradigm of people putting together the canon of Scripture that we have today. There can be no doubt that the central theme of Jesus' teaching was the restoration of the true temple and what it meant. That is quite the statement. He was proclaimed to be the Melchizedek priest the expected Messiah described in the Melchizedek text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. People don't want to... Like, we talk about the plain and precious truths lost. I, I have to agree with her that it was, it was the stuff about the temple and, and before this Deuteronomic reforms, as well-intentioned as it could have been, but it just makes... The purpose of Lehi, all the more important, and the Book of Mormon, all the more important. But what had happened to the Melchizedek priesthood? Like, good question. People feel in, in mainstream Christianity that we have everything still, but what about the priesthood that Jesus had? Because there were more, there were more priests. He wasn't, it wasn't an order of one, as far as we can tell. One of the great moments in my own journey of discovery was reading an article published in 1980, showing that the religion of Abraham must have survived until the time of Josiah. That would be a major change in paradigm. Because the Deuteronomists were going back to the Aaronic things. But if some of that had been intact during that, 
we it would have been purged from the record. We don't know what we don't know. And, and that's just the truth. Um, because that was the part he purged from his kingdom. In 600 BCE, the religion of Abraham was not just a distant memory. That is quite a thing to say, quite a big statement. This suggests that the Melchizedek priesthood also survived until the time of Josiah. Like, who was associated with the monarchy? As Psalms 110 uh, uh, makes clear, it was superseded in Jerusalem by the Aaronic priesthood very much later than we often suppose. Again, big statements. It is likely that Aaron's family came to prominence in Jerusalem only when Moses did, as a result of King Josiah's changes around 600 BCE. And that wouldn't mean that they weren't important. But obviously, it, it, the Deuteronomist seeing this book of the law, it's like, wow, this, this is the... Like, if we had all these scrolls, you can, like, they were practicing a million ways. And at least they could look back and know that this is a point where the Lord gave his word. So we're going to do these, we're going to go back to these 10 commandments. And we're going to have a whole bunch of provisions and extra commandments or, or, or uh, policies to help us focus on these 10 commandments. And all these other things that we don't see, um, like we're going to get rid of them because we don't know where they came from. If it's not, if they didn't come in this way that we can see uh, the, if it doesn't get go back to Moses, then we, you know, it just doesn't make sense to us. We're going to get rid of it. This other esoteric sort of weird stuff, this weird stuff in the temple that we don't understand, we're going to get rid of it. And we don't know what they got rid of. Um, man. Last paragraph. There were long memories of the lost temple. In the time of the Messiah, it was said the true temple would be restored. Amazing. The spirit, the fire, the cherubim and the ark, but also the anointing oil and the and the menorah. It's so interesting that that the same sort of the same sort of mindset of the Deuteronomists exists today, where we just have no need for angels and and and. Um, we have no need for prophets and guidance. And like, we know that the, the, we know that the story of the Bible is, is taking a few steps, kind of getting misguided, misunderstanding things. A prophet is sent, kind of sets them back on the way. They get misguided again. They get realigned. And then we have Jesus and the apostles, and they go out to teach everything. But as they are going around, we know that it's like they are warning about wolves in sheep's clothing coming in and and changing some things, and, and them getting getting killed. And we know that the Catholic Church uh, they proclaim kind of the ironic line through Peter um but but Jesus was of the order of Melchizedek and he gave he gave his apostles we can assume that same that same th like the apostles had a different priesthood than bishops and we see that in the writings of the early bishops like early catholic bishops we know that people could baptize, but only by the laying on of hands by one with authority, like the apostles, would they be able to give the Holy Ghost. 
and we and also one of the roles of uh, these apostles was to go and ordain bishops bishops cannot choose their own successor and that was in the early, like the early some of the early people like the early christians even wrote about this it was in there and so uh without the apostles someone with that authority to do so there are things that were lost and and we have to we have to thank the catholics for like for for holding on to these these writings and doing their best with with having it passed around the world and things but there are things that were lost and we can see the foundation of the deuteronomists today in my opinion all right let's get through this there were uh there were long memories of the lost temple in the time of the messiah it was said the true temple would be restored the spirit of fire the, the, okay we did this this is strange because there was a seven branched lamp in the second temple but maybe it did not represent what the original had represented such as a tree it was not the tree of life in the second temple down until the n- times of the new testament the era of melchizedek was linked to the memories of the temple the spirit the fire the anointing oil and the lamp representing the tree of life it should not go unnoticed that these memories are also linking linked to the coming of the messiah in the texts of the book of mormon so i think i've said everything i need to say if you liked this uh give it a like uh subscribe if you haven't share this to people who would like appreciate it like a- appreciate long form stuff like this i know it was long but like the book of mormon is true a- and we should be we should be just feasting upon this sort of stuff and this is my favorite thing um, I never considered the Deuteronomist reforms at, in the light of Laman and Lamuel before like a couple weeks ago, and it got me just looking at more stuff, and I was so glad I found this. And uh, I, I got to go deeper into these sources now because she had a lot of big things to say. Um, but how interesting. How interesting. Talk to you guys uh, soon. Bye-bye.